Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. It's always wonderful to see you. Uh, today's Torah portion is Balak, found on page 856. That's 856. If you're in the Blue Oscar Chumash, if you're not in the Blue Oscar Chumash, it's in the middle of chapter 22 of the Book of Numbers. Um, it's actually the uh, second verse of the Book of Numbers. So the name of this week's Torah portion is Balak. Who was Balak? He was the king of Moab. And what does he do in this week's Torah portion? He hires a Gentile prophet by the name of Bilam. Now, really, the main character of this week's Torah portion is not Balak. It's really Bilam, because he's the one we're going to be talking about, the Gentile prophet who was hired to curse the Jews and ended up blessing the Jews. His blessings are quite famous. The most famous blessing he ever gave the Jews in this week's Torah portion is repeated and recited each and every day in the synagogue. When we enter into the synagogue, one of the first prayers we say is, Ma tovu Yaakov mishkanotecha Yitrael. I'm sure you all know many songs to that verse, very popular verse. How goodly are your tents? Ma tovu Yaakov. How goodly are your tents, Jacob, your dwelling houses, O Israel. Now, we say it when entering the synagogue because we're praising the sanctuary, the dwelling place of the Jewish people. Although there's a lot of commentary on that verse, we'll maybe save that for a little later, perhaps. But just the general overview is that he looks at the Jewish people and their encampment in the desert, and he says, how goodly are your tents, O Jacob, your dwelling houses, O Israel. So it's really the story of Bilam, this Gentile prophet. Now, a little background on Bilam. Bilam was no ordinary prophet. There's a midrash that says that there's a verse about Moses at the end of his life that eulogizes Moses after he dies at the end of the Torah. And the verse says that never again has there arisen in Israel a prophet like Moses, right? Moses was the greatest prophet ever. But the verse specifies amongst Israel, amongst the Jewish people. Doesn't say there was never a prophet as great as Moses. It says there was never in Israel a prophet as great as Moses. Hence the rabbis say, there was a non-Jewish prophet who was as great as Moses. And who was that? Bilam. So the rabbis placed Bilam on the same prophetic level as Moses. So just so you know, he's not a lightweight. Okay, he's in the major leagues, this guy Bilam. So much so that he's the equivalent, the comparison of Moses to the Jewish people. That's what Bilam was to the Gentile prophet. And the idea is that God 
provides leaders and spiritual guides and prophets to all the nations because God doesn't only want the Jewish people to have great prophets and follow in his ways. God has to communicate with all of mankind his directives, his vision. So therefore he does have Gentile prophets. So what was the, fa the falling or the failing, the shortcoming of Bilam? So rabbis brilliantly tell us that you can find it in his uh, very name. Uh, first, a little joke, okay? Uh, or I should say, a, uh, it's not a joke, it's more like a witty comment. What's the story? We'll get into the details, but Balak pays Bilam a large sum of money, gold and silver, to come and curse the Jews. Now, in the opening verses, it describes how first he sends a delegation to Bilam. He says, I want you to come curse the Jews. And Bilam says, I can't do anything without God's permission. I'm, I, I work for God, a prophet. I got to ask my boss. Stay the night, I'll ask God. During the night, he communicates with God. God says, don't go with them. Their Jewish nation is a blessed nation. I don't want you to curse the Jewish nation. So he sends them off the next morning. He says, listen, I can't help you. I, I, I didn't get permission from God to curse the Jews. I can't do anything God doesn't tell me to do. I'm a prophet. I have to speak God's words. But then when... Balak gets the rejection. His delegation comes back and says, Bilam doesn't want to go with you, us. He doesn't want to come curse the Jews. He's not so, uh, he's not willing to give in so fast. He's not a uh, pushover. So he sends back a stronger delegation, larger, more honored, honor, uh, honorary dignitaries. And he says, I'll give you gold and silver and wealth and power and honor. Just come and curse the Jews. Because Balak realized that the Jews were too blessed, meaning that they were winning the wars because they had God on their side. They, they, had, they defeated many enemies up until this point. He says, maybe I'll get a spiritual power to weaken them. So then what has happened? Uh, Bilam says, I'll tell you what, stay the night. I'll ask God again. And this time he asks God and God says, okay, if you want to go, go. But whatever I put in your mouth is what you're going to say. And sure enough, God puts blessings in his mouth. So a rabbi say, what the direction that a person wants to go you really want to go, I'll let you go. God doesn't stand in our way, not just for good things, but for bad things. If we choose a bad path, God doesn't stand in our way. He gave us free will. When Bilam really, the first time he asked, you want to know what I wanted? No, don't go. But if you insist you want to go, go ahead. We'll get to that soon. But we had a member of our synagogue, an extraordinary man. His name was Dr. Edward Stein, we best of memory. Maybe some of you remember him passed away a number of years ago, but he was very witty. And he said, he, he had this, like, he used to say, Bilam, you know, why did Bilam go to curse the Jews? Because he wanted a Bilam. He wanted a Bilam, right? He wanted to make money. He wanted to bill Balak for his services, right? Now, while that was a witty statement, Bilam went because he wanted a Bilam. Um, our rabbis actually say that in a very profound way. If you take the word Bilam, it's quite remarkable. You can make two words out of it. The two words are Bili Am, without a nation. Now, why is this so telling about Bilam? Because in his very name, without a nation, Bili Am, you understand his whole character and why he was a failed prophet. And by the way, he's, he does some really bad things at the end of the Parsha. He goes from bad to worse. And he meets uh, his, his punishment later on. A few weeks from now, he's going to die by the sword. So he's a very tragic figure. Because, why is he a tragic figure? Because, you know, God gives people gifts. If God doesn't give you any gifts, you have no talents, you have no skills, you have no capabilities. Okay, what could be expected of you? When God gives you an extraordinary gift like Bilan, that you have prophetic powers, you have a choice how to use those powers. You could either use it for the good, and that's true with every person. Whatever you have, intelligence, uh, skills, wealth, whatever God gives you, how are you going to use it? But the greatest tragedy is when a person's given tremendous abilities and capabilities and skills and powers, and they abuse it and misuse it. Bilam could have been an inspiration for the world. He could have been a real prophet bringing God's vision for humanity to the nations of the world, just like there's a Moses for the Jewish people. But what is he? He's a corrupt politician, so to speak, right? 
What is, what's a corrupt politician? I'll use my power as a politician in Congress and the Senate or whatever. Just pay me money. Give me money and I'll use my power in a corrupt way. And that's even worse because you were elected to do good, not to do bad. Same thing with Billam. Billam says it's all about the money. Give me gold, give me silver. I'm like, I hate to use the word, I'm like a prostitute. I'll do whatever you pay me to do. You want me to curse the Jews? I'll curse the Jews. I don't care. I'm not living up to a higher consciousness of responsibility as is expected for me. And that's all in his name, Belion. He has no nation. You see, a prophet should have a nation. A leader should have people that he's loyal to. I'm the leader of this nation. What's the worst crime a politician could ever commit, right? The worst crime a politician, besides being corrupt, is when they are disloyal to their own nation, right? In other words, you were elected to serve this people. You were put in a position of power to re represent our interests, right? But you instead used it for the benefit of others. And that is treason because it's using your power in a disloyal way. It's treasonous, you're betraying your own country. Bilam, Bilam means he has no nation. He'll, he'll go work for whoever pays him the top dollar. There's no loyalty, there's no fidelity, there's no trust. And therefore he's a failed prophet. And as I said, at the end of the Parsha, he goes to curse the Jews throughout the Parsha. We're going to read the whole episode. It's quite remarkable. And every time he opens his mouth, another blessing comes out about the Jewish people. But unfortunately, at the end of the Parsha, he finds a way to succeed. Because, and I know I'm giving you the end of the Parsha already, but we'll maybe circle back to it. I'm giving you the plot. But at the end, Balak, is, uh, Balak the king of Moab, is very upset at Bilam. He says, I paid you top dollar. I brought you into town. I imported you to come and curse the Jews, to weaken them. And what did you do? Not only didn't you curse them, you heaped blessings on them. And like I said, till today, we're chanting his blessings, which is another remarkable concept. So Bilam says, look, I told you on day one, because he told the delegation, he says, look, God told me I can go, but only what he gives me permission to say, will I be able to say, I, I warned you, I told you I could only say what God allows me to say. But then in the ninth inning, before the parasha ends, he says, listen, this is the only advice I could give you. This is Bilam talking to Balak. He said, I couldn't curse them. God didn't allow me to curse them. Why? Because God loves them. But if you could get God to be upset with them, if you could get God to you know, be disappointed in them, then you will be successful in destroying them. So what does he tell Balak, the king of Moab? He says, Tell the girls, the daughters of Moab, to go out and seduce the Jewish men in immoral relationships. And once the Jews are sinning with the Moabite women, and this is not just with you know, the immorality of it, but the Moabite women will lead the Jewish men to their idolatrous practices, then God's anger will be upon the Jewish people. And then... They will be weakened from within, and then you could destroy them. And unfortunately, there's a terrible, there's a, there's a, I'm now getting into next week's Torah portion, which is Pinchas. There's a, the Jewish men are frolicking with the Moabite women, and a man by the name of Pinchas stands up to turn around the wrath of God by killing a Jewish leader who's engaging with a Midianite princess, Zimri and Cosby, but that's next week. But regardless, there was a plague, and the last verse of the Torah portion is, 24,000 Jews died because of the plague. So was Bilam successful? In the first, in the majority of the parsha, he's not successful. His blood curses become blessings. It actually backfires. But at the end, he is successful because he gets the Jewish people to sin. Eventually, he will die in the war with Midian. He will be killed by the sword because of what he did. But Bilam is a tragic figure with a very important lesson. And the lesson is the very obvious lesson. And that is that Every person has to be guided by values, by principles, by morals, by ethics, and never be tempted by money or fame or power to betray your own values, ideals, and 
your promise that God gave you and your loyalty and your fidelity, you know, to your nation. You know, there are stories amongst Jews over the years, Jews who turned against other Jews for whatever interest, informers or people, even there were capos in the concentration camps who worked for the Nazis in the Roman times, people who informed on other Jews for their own personal advancement. And that's what Bilam was. Bilam was a person who believed, um, or he did it to Bilam. It was just about whoever would pay him top dollar. There were no ethics or morals or values in place. So that is uh, the figure who is the, really, like I said, the name of the Torah portion is Balak, but it's really more about Bilam, uh, who is this Gentile prophet and hired to curse the Jewish people. Now, again, I, as I always say, I love to know what's on your mind. So if you have questions or comments or you want to address anything, please feel free to type it in so we could, you know, have a, a nice Torah conversation. So going back to the Torah portion, um, there's a Yiddish expression, and I'm, gonna, I'm sort of going to the highlights of the Torah portion. Um, there's a Yiddish expression Mensch tracht und Gott lacht. Have you ever heard that expression? Okay, I see a thumbs up from Amy. Very good. Literally translated, it means man thinks and God laughs. Now, I once heard a Gentile, I was once at a, an event at Good Samaritan Hospital. They were dedicating a new wing, and this non Jewish speaker said, There's a Yiddish proverb that says, If you want to make God laugh, make plans. Right, he took that phrase and twisted a little bit. If you want to make God laugh, make plans. Or as the Yiddish expression goes, mens tracht und Gott lacht. Now the question is, why would God laugh? I mean, we all make plans, right? That's part of life. You got to make plans. Why would God laugh at your plans? So the Yiddish expression saying is like God is laughing, so to speak, because you think this is gonna, you're gonna make this plan. I'm in control. But why would God laugh? You know, why laugh at a person? It's good to make plans, right? What's wrong with making a plan? We need a plan. As they say, plan, uh, uh, they say, how does the expression go? Um, if you don't plan, failing to plan is planning to fail. I think that's the expression. Failing to plan is planning to fail. You need a plan in life, right? So what does it really mean, the Yiddish expression? What it means to say is people who make arrogant plans, People who think they can outsmart God, those are the plans God laughs at. People who are so haughty and arrogant and filled with ego that they think they can go against the will of God and succeed with their big plans, that's who God laughs at. God laughs at the evil people in history who think that they could challenge God's authority and plan on succeeding in despite the fact that God said this cannot be done, this should not be done. That's the way I interpret this phrase. If you're making good plans, how to make the world a better place, God's not laughing. God's applauding you and saying, good, go for it. Or you're making a plan for your family to, to do good things, that's wonderful. It's evil plans. And we actually say it, there's a verse, it's from the book of Psalms, we say it, you'll see it in the fine print after the end of the Alenu prayer in every sitter. It says, it says like this, it says, don't be afraid of a sudden fright. Uh, and, the, and the, the scheming and the devising plans of the wicked. Why should you not be fearful? Because uh, they plan and they plot and it will become naught. Dabru Dava, they'll speak all different types of words. It will not stand. Why Kimonu kill? God is with us. So there's a, in, in some synagogues, like in Chabad synagogues, you may know they sing it at the end. Altira, mi pachatis. It's a very important passage. It's in the fine print, but it's, a, it's the way we leave the synagogue three times a day. And what we're saying is, don't be afraid of the evildoers' plans. They will fail. Why? Because God is with us. God is with the righteous. There's actually a verse in the Hallel, also from King Psalms, that says, Hallelujah, Sashem, all the nations will also praise a God. Why? All the Shabachu, Lord Him, all the 
people's, why? Because God has done kindness with us. So one of the explanations given by Itzla from Belashen, he says, why should the other nations thank God for the good that God does for us? We should thank him. Why the other nations? And the answer is because they plan things and they see how it doesn't come to pass and they realize how God is protecting the Jewish people. But going back to this idea that God laughs at evil plans, arrogant plans, egotistical, narcissistic plans. And that's where the ultimate example of mensch tracht und Gott lacht is this week's Torah portion. It's, 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 it's almost humorous. It's almost, uh, it's, it's just extraordinary. What is it? So you may know this by now because you've been reading the Torah portion every week, but everyone knows now in America, past, I don't know how many years it's been, there was a movie called Shrek. And Shrek is about a talking donkey that became very, very popular, especially amongst children. Everyone knows about Shrek. The original Shrek is in this week's Torah portion. That's right. In this week's Torah portion, we have a talking donkey. A talking donkey. Now, in the Garden of Eden, we had a talking snake, right? The snake says to Eve and then to Adam. But in this week's Parsha, we have a talking donkey. I don't know of any other story in the Torah about a talking dog or a talking cow or, you know, the Talmud maybe, but not in the Torah. But here's what happens. And you're going to have to read the Torah portion for all the details. But basically, as Bilaam's going with this whole entourage of dignitaries who came to take him on his road to his journey to Moab to curse the Jews, he's riding on his donkey. And what happens? Let me get to the exact same place. Oh, before I get to the talking donkey, there's another very powerful thought in this week's Torah portion. When Bilaam gets the green light from God, okay, you want to go, go, but only what I tell you to say will you say. He's so excited that it says, he woke up in the morning. Vayakam Bilam Baboka. Bilam arose in the morning. Vayachvosh et Asono. He saddled his donkey and went with the officers of Moab, the delegation. And Rashi makes this unbelievable observation. Rashi says, Where do we find an almost identical verse by Abraham? When God told Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac, it says, Abraham woke up early in the morning and saddled his own donkey. Now, the question is, Abraham had a lot of servants and Bilaam had a lot of servants. He was like a very important person. He was the chief prophet of the nations of the world. It's unbecoming for him to saddle his own donkey early in the morning. First of all, he could have slept a little later. And second of all, he could have had his servants, you know, pull up the car and, and fill the gas tank and get it ready for the journey. Why is he going to saddle his donkey? And our rabbis say, for the same reason that Abraham got up early. And here's an amazing quote from Rashi. Rashi says that there are two things that make people act in abnormal ways. You know what those two things are? Love and hate. When you love someone, you act in an abnormal way out of love. And when you hate someone, you act in an abnormal way. It was abnormal for Abraham to get up early and saddle his own donkey before anyone else woke up, so to speak. But because of his love for God, he couldn't wait. He went and did it himself. And Bilaam's hatred, and here we see he was a hater, was so great that he got up early in the morning to saddle his own donkey as well. And so love and hate cause people to think irrationally and behave irrationally. Someone told me something, Howard Amster, one of our members, was telling me at the Torah class on Shabbat, Something that's very interesting. He said that there's, uh, you know, everyone knows Shark Tank. People go and pitch different business ideas. So apparently somebody pitched an idea on Shark Tank. Apparently it's an existing company. I don't know how it's doing right now. But, you know, there's a million different dating apps today. It's a remarkable thing how many people meet their soulmates on dating apps. It's a multi-billion dollar business today, you know. Jewish dating apps, non-Jewish ones, the whole, and it really works. Thank God, a lot of people find their basher on a, on a dating app. But listen to what this guy came up with for a dating app. He came up with this idea that basically you match people. You know, usually think, how do you match two people? What are their common interests? What are their common values? If they have more commonality, they're a good shidduch, right? He does something just the opposite. He says, what do pe he says, hatred is very strong. What do people hate? And he matches people on what they hate. So the way this app 
um, goes is they ask you a series of questions. And you say if you love it or you hate it, right? And they get this profile of you based on what you hate. So I don't know. You, you hate uh, this, uh, this uh, politician. You hate this food. You hate this when people do this. I hate when people do that, you know? And they find people who match each other based on what they hate. Because hate is a very powerful emotion. So Bilam is a hater. Abraham is a lover. Because he's a lover, he loves God. He gets up early in the morning to saddle his own donkey, just like Bilam gets up early. But here's the most powerful part of the Rashi. Rashi says, and this is so important, so beautiful. Omar Kaddish Baruch Almighty God says to Bilam, so to speak, Russia, you wicked person, you think you're going to get up early in the morning and succeed by getting up early and saddling your own donkey to go curse the Jews? Guess what? Kfar Kadmach Avram Avinu. Abraham, the forefather of this nation, already got up early before you, like a thousand years earlier. As it says, Abraham got up early in the morning and sold his donkey. So what Rashi is saying is that you're motivated by hatred of the Jews to go curse them. But the father of this nation, the patriarch of this nation, Abraham, was motivated by love. And he got up early in the morning to do God's will out of love. So Abraham's love for God will stand up and counteract your hatred and defeat it. Because ultimately, love is more powerful than hatred. And therefore, yes, you may be motivated by hate, which is very strong, very powerful, but love is greater. And the merit of their father, Abraham, who stood up, got up early to sacrifice his son for God's will, will protect them from your curses and bring blessing upon them. And what it shows you is that a good deed has lasting power, staying power. A good deed but done by Abraham. Abraham lived many centuries before Billah. But yet, maybe five, six hundred years before Bilam, but the good deed that Abraham did five, six hundred years earlier stood up to protect his children from an evil man by the name of Bilam. And the idea that you could do something good today, you know, people always want to see immediate results. You know, where we live in a generation that uh, the word instant is found instant coffee, instant this, instant that. And therefore, we expect instant results. You could do a good deed and you don't see the merit. You don't see the payback. You don't see the reward instantaneously. Like in the case of Abraham, it didn't come till hundreds of years later. But no good deed is ever forgotten or not recorded by God. Every good deed is recorded, remembered. You may have forgotten what you did, but God still remembers. And when you need that mitzvah to be a protection, a salvation for you, it will be there. If not for you, for your children, you, whoever, your grandchildren, great-grandchildren. So going back to the talking donkey. So what happens? He heads on his way. And here's, I'm, I'm just going to give you the story as described in the Torah. If you're following along, it's chapter 22. It starts uh, with Verse 22, it's on top of page 860 in our Blue Ox Grow Chumash. And what does it say? It says, God's upset at him that he's going. God let him go, but God's not happy about it. So what happens? An angel of God comes on the path to uh, impede him. And he's going, Bilam, with his two lads on his sides. And here's the verse. The donkey sees the angel of God standing before him with a sword in his hands. So there's an angel with a sword right in front of Bilam. And so the donkey veers from the path to get around this angel with the sword. And it goes into a field, goes off the path into a field. So what does Bilam do? He strikes the donkey to get it back on the path. So then what happens? The angel stands in the pathway of the vineyards and there's a fence on both sides. So there's a narrow space. He can't get through. Once again, the donkey sees the angel of God. So he presses himself into the wall. And the foot of Bilam gets crushed against the wall. So he strikes it again. Now the angel goes to a third location where there's no way to go right or left. 
and now the angel can't, is right in front of him with the sword, and uh, he can't go anywhere, the, the donkey. So what does the donkey do? He crouches down. And now Bill is really angry. So what does he do? He hits the donkey again. And here's the famous verse, 28, chapter 22. Hashem et God opens the mouth of the donkey. The she donkey says to Bilam, what have you done to me that you struck me three times? And Bilam says to his donkey, now he's talking to a donkey. You made a mockery of me. I'm going with all these important dignitaries and you, fool, you go this way into the field. Then you press my foot against the wall. Now you sit down underneath me. If I had a sword in my hand, Bilam says, I would kill you right now, he says to the donkey. And listen to the words of the donkey. The donkey says to Bilam, am I not your faithful donkey that you've ridden upon your whole life? Would I have done this? Have I ever done this to you before? Like, why are you hitting me? Don't you realize something's going on? And Bilam admits, he says, no, you've never done this before. This is unusual behavior for you. And he has, boom, verse 31. God uncovered Bilam's eyes. And what does he see? He sees the angel of Hashem standing on the road with his sword drawn in his hand. And he bows his head and prostrates himself on his face. And the angel of God says to Bilam, why did you hit your donkey three times? I was the one who was standing in his path and he was trying to avoid me. That's why he veered off the path. And Bilam says, I'm sorry, I sinned. I didn't know that you were in front of me. If you want, I'll go back. Uh, if you don't want me to go on this mission, I'll return. And once again, the angel says, no, you can go. Continue on your way to curse the Jews. But remember, only what God allows you to say will you say. That will you speak. And this is an amazing story. But I think it epitomizes and crystallizes the idea that God laughs at those who make bad plans. Bilam has all these big plans. He's going to get rich. He's going to curse the Jews. He's going to defeat all of that. And God la makes a mockery of him. God laughs at him. He shows him that the donkey, you think you're, what, what is Bilam's claim to fame? That he's a prophet, that he could see God. He could talk to God. He could connect with God. And what is God showing him? God's showing him that all of your abilities is thanks to me. I gave you that ability to talk to God. If I want, I can have a donkey see more spirituality than you, the greatest prophet, could see. You didn't see the angel of God on the road, even though you're the biggest prophet. But a donkey, an animal, was able to see it. You could be less than an animal. And what God is trying to do, perhaps, is humble him in preparation for this journey. Don't get caught up with your great abilities. Who gave you those abilities? And again, this is such an important lesson. You know, we read about talking donkeys. This is not just a story like Shrek, a nice entertainment. So this is a very deep message because sometimes we get caught up with our own strengths and abilities and we become prideful or arrogant and we forget we're just here to do Hashem's will. We're here to carry out Hashem's will to use whatever abilities he gave us for a positive purpose. And the minute we start misusing it, God reminds us we're not in charge. Hashem wants he could take away those abilities to you. He could give it to a donkey and the donkey could be more capable than you. So whatever it is, let's say somebody's very wealthy and the, the wealth gets to their head and they start acting immorally or improperly. And God says, woman, well, you think you're such a great businessman. You made all this money on your own. I gave you this ability. I could, God forbid, take it away and give it to someone else. And the biggest homeless guy could become the most successful business person if I give him that ability to make money. And you could become a pauper, God forbid, right? The same thing is here. You think you're the greatest prophet? You don't see the angel. The donkey sees the angel. And this is the idea of God laughs when man makes plans that are contrary to God's will. God says, listen, don't forget, you're just a vehicle that God is giving these abilities to to accomplish certain things in this world. So that is... That is the, um, the, an amazing story about the speaking donkey. And also the idea that, you know, there's a Yiddish expression. It's not as popular as the one got tracked. Uh, Men's tracked and got locked is a very popular one. Man thinks and God laughs. But there's a lot of great Yiddish ex expressions. And one Yiddish expression is, as the Abish Deville 
Can a bezim shisen? A bezim is a broom. Shisen means shoot. If God wants, a broom could shoot. Imagine you pick up a broom and it starts shooting. But if God wants, a broom could shoot. It's a Yiddish expression, but the idea is very powerful. God could do anything. God can make a, a broom shoot and the most unlikely person be successful or the most unlikely person accomplish great things. It's not about us. It's about what Hashem wants to achieve. And that's the message God is communicating to Bilam because God doesn't make miracles in vain. A speaking donkey is a miracle. The miracle has a purpose. The purpose is to teach Bilam a lesson, a lesson in humility. Now, we talked a little bit about this great prophecy, Ma tovu alecha Yaakov, how goodly are your tents, Jacob, your dwelling house is Israel, how we say this as we enter into the synagogue. It refers to the Jewish home. It refers to the synagogue. And by the way, specifically, Rashi says, what did he see that was so impressive? He saw that the way that the tents of Israel were situated and the way they encamped, no two doors faced each other so that everyone had privacy. It was modesty and privacy, but it's also taken in a broader sense, the way the Jewish people dwell together as a community, how we help each other, how we care about each other, how we look out for one another. This is the beauty of the Jewish community, the Jewish camp, with the synagogue at the center, the Torah study hall in the center. In the center. And this is very much till today, the story of the Jewish people, right? Where we... We, we have communities that are strong and vibrant and people care about one another and help one another and support each other. And the synagogue is the, the focal point the, the, uh, where we come to study and to pray together as a community. This is all part of what he saw when he said, Matovu, how goodly are your tents. And by the way, just so much commentary on this verse, because you can imagine if it's in our daily prayers, obviously it's pretty important not just in our daily prayers, but the first prayer. And there's so much commentary, but one of the ideas is, why do we start when we come into the synagogue? It says in the Siddur, when you walk into the synagogue, you should say, Matovo, how goodly are your tents, Jacob, your dwelling house is Israel. Now, true, it talks about how beautiful the synagogue and the houses of Israel is, whether it's the study hall, a rabbi say, or lecha means the Torah study hall, Mishkanotech is the synagogue, the prayer, or both combined. But you could go through the book of Psalms and you could find many verses about how great the synagogue is. I mean, King David, we're going to start coming to the month of El. He says, I request one thing. I want to sit in the house of the Lord all the days of my day. It's gaze in the pleasantness of God and to dwell in his sanctuary. We could say that verse when we walk into the synagogue. Why are we starting with Matovu? And just one thought that I remember once learning, which I thought was very beautiful, is that here, Bilam came with an intention to curse the Jews. But as much as he tried, and by the way, he doesn't just try once, he keeps on trying from different angles, from different purchases, from different perspectives, but he can't find a way to curse the Jews. And the message for us by quoting this verse every day is, hey, dear Jew, you just got up today, you're about to start your day, guess what? There are people who are gonna look at you during the course of your day, and for no other reason than that you're a Jew, they're gonna try to hurl a curse at you. That doesn't mean they're gonna verbally say it to your face, but in their mind, in their heart, they're gonna wish you bad because you're a Jew. There's anti-Semitism out there. There are Bilaams till today. But just like the Jews gave Bilaam no opportunity to curse them, but on the contrary, forced them to elicit blessings because when he looked, he saw so much good. It was, it was undeniable. He had to pronounce the blessings of the Jews, how goodly and godly their tents are. So too, we have to be inspired by this story, that if you encounter a Bilam over the course of your day who wants to say something negative, wants to shower you, God forbid, with a curse, wants to say, look at that Jew, that terrible thing they did. As Jews, we have a huge responsibility. And that is not only not to do anything, God forbid, that would be deserving of a curse or incriminating ourselves with our behaviors, but much more than that. That even those who are looking for the negative, those who are seeking to pronounce a curse, those who are looking for our faults just because they're anti-Semitic or whatever their motivation is, like Bilam, he was getting paid. They look at you and your actions, your behavior, 
your character should be so noble, so righteous, so kind and good that your enemies are forced to say how goodly, how wonderful, how terrific, how incredible. You should elicit blessings from people, even against their own will, like Bilam. So that's just an idea. But there is a verse that is just unbelievable in this week's parsha. And again, we know the Torah is from Hashem. So the Torah is eternal. It's everlasting. And therefore, it is uh, not really a surprise, but it's still remarkable to see how the words of the Torah spoken through God, from God through Bilam, so true till today. And it's verse 9 in chapter 23. And this is Bilam speaking. And this is what he says. He says, from its origins, I see it rock light like, and from hills do I see it. Now, Rabbi said, what does it mean from its origins? He says, going back to the patriarchs and the matriarchs, the rocks and the hills, he talks about the foundation of the Jewish nation. But listen to these next. There are only seven words, but how true they've been and remain till today. Only God who's eternal, could have said such words. Hein am levadad yishkon. Behold, it is a nation that will dwell in solitude. Uvagayim lo yitchashav. And not be reckoned among the nations. You know how we always say, how is it that the United Nation passes more resolutions against little tiny Israel than any other nation in the world. Are we the worst nation on earth? Every year, UN passes resolutions against many different countries. But while Iran or China get, you know, a handful of condemnations, Israel gets the biggest number of condemnations. The only democracy, and granted, no, no nation is perfect, but the one nation that's a blessing to humanity, in the, especially in a place like the Middle East with no democracy, no freedom, no human rights. And Israel is the one beacon of light in the whole Middle East. And this country gets more condemnations than Egypt and Iran and Saudi Arabia and China. And uh, how, do, how does this make any sense? And we always scratch our head. What, what does the UN want from uh, Israel? Same thing with anti-Semitism. There's no BDS against Iran, against China, against all the other countries. Israel gets BDS, boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Why is everyone ganging up on Israel? And it really makes no sense. I'm going to Israel tomorrow, God willing. It's a beautiful place with beautiful people in it, beautiful accomplishments that help the whole world, not just Israel. Startup nation, all the inventions, all the creativity, med medical breakthroughs, scientific breakthroughs. The only way to understand it is to listen to the words of Bilam. They are a nation that dwells alone and will never be reckoned amongst the nations. They will always be apart. They will always be in solitude. They will always be lonely. They will always be isolated. And the nations will never reckon with them. They will never consider us like any other nation. We will always be, in the English here, it says in solitude. Now. The prediction is eerily frightening because it's so true till today. It doesn't change. No matter what the Jewish people do, Theodore Herzl thought, okay, we're going to go to Israel, we're going to make our own country. Finally, the world is going to accept us. As they say in Yiddish, nothing changes. There's nothing we can do to be reckoned amongst the nations. The Jew is always the pariah, the one who's isolated. But the real question is, Bilam is speaking blessings. This sounds like a curse. If I tell you, you're never going to have friends. You're always going to be in isolation. You're always going to be lonely. You're always going to be in solitude. Nobody's ever going to reckon with you. Sounds like a curse. But this is part of the blessings. How is it a blessing? And it's a tough one. And it's tough as the Jews to always be facing anti-Semitism and the horrors that the world has perpetrated against the Jewish people. But the word hen am levadad yishkon, the word badad 
you know, we just came from, <laughs> my son, Yosef, just went to camp this morning. I took him to Miami International Airport. He's going to six weeks summer camp, right? God willing, I'm going tomorrow. Dini's there with a group of women now. But we know that Israel's wide open now. Everyone can come. And the amount of tourism is just remarkable now. Maccabea games are starting on Thursday night. The whole world is in Israel. Dini tells me Friday she was going through the shook. You know, usually you got to like squeeze through the shook. Now you can't even get through. There's no, it's jam packed. Everyone and their mother is in Israel right now. Thank God. One of the reasons is because people were pent up for two years. You couldn't go to Israel. You needed uh, vaccination cards and the uh, PCR tests. Now, everyone's welcome. What was the word for quarantine in Hebrew? We, we, we got to know what quarantine means, or, right? The word in Hebrew is bidut, levadat, quarantine. You're alone. You're separated. You're in isolation. So there's different ways to translate this word, hein am levadat yishkon, solitude. Now, if you say it's loneliness, loneliness is terrible. If I say you're lonely, that's not a blessing. But if I say you're in solitude, solitude is not a curse. Sometimes solitude is good for a person, right? So is it you're alone or you're in solitude? In other words, are you alone as a nation or are you apart as a nation? In other words, the Jewish people are a people that dwells apart. That's what Bill I'm saying is. They're not like any other nation. Other nations, you know, they just integrate, they assimilate. Wherever they go, they become like the nation they are. Jews are always a part. A Jew could be anywhere in the world. He still lives as a Jew. He could be a Russian Jew, an American Jew, a Chinese Jew, an Australian Jew, but he's still a Jew. And he's a Jewish Australian, a Jewish American. He's a Jew first and foremost. So... What he's saying is that wherever a Jew is, he doesn't reckon with the nation. Now, of course, we follow the law of the land. If you're American, you got to pay taxes and you got to follow all the laws of your country. You're an American. The law of the land is the law. But within America, you're your own person. You keep kosher, you keep Shabbat, you have a mezuzah on your door, you put on your, right? You have your own, yeah, yeah there's Thanksgiving and New Year's, but there's Hanukkah and Purim and Pesach. You have your own holidays. You're a nation that's a part, not part, not reckoning amongst all the nations and that's what and that's why the world hates us to some degree so why do we insist on being apart and rabbi jonathan sachs puts it this way he's written about this even wrote a book about it it's called the dignity of difference what's the dignity of difference you know one of the most popular words today literally in the last few years is the word inclusion everything's about inclusion today businesses they train people everything's inclusion what's inclusion it's it's a very good ideal. We cannot be a society that rejects certain individuals. We have to include everyone. Everyone has to have a seat at the table. We have to be inclusionary. Now, it doesn't say to the people who are different, become like us. No, you have to stay who you are. You have a right to be who you are. Whatever you are, you can be who you are. We, who are the majority, have to include you, even though you're not like us, even though you're different. Who are the first people who stood up for this value? The Jewish people. The Jewish people said, we are here, unity, not uniformity, yes. We are here as a protest against lack of inclusion. We have, we have a right to be ourselves, to be different, to do our own thing. And you have an obligation not to hate us for it, not to reject us, not to scorn us or to isolate us, but to the idea that everyone is welcomed. Everyone has an equal place in this world. We're all in the image of God. And we are like that protest, standing up to the lack of inclusion, saying, no, we have a right to exist in this world, just like you do. And even though we're not, we're the minority and the Jewish people are less than one quarter of 1% of the world, we are here to stay. And you have to learn to include us. You have to learn to accept us. And that's the idea. We are a nation that dwells apart. We don't want to be a lonely nation. We love to have friends. The more friends we have, the happier we are. Look at what Israel has done now with the Abraham Accords, making friends in the Middle East. We have Christian friends who are our friends who support Israel. Nothing makes a Jew happier than to see that we have friendships. We don't insist on being a lonely nation. We don't want to be a lonely nation. What we want to say is we want to be a friend, but not by giving up who we are. 
We're not going to compromise. We're not going to surrender our identity to fit into some other identity. Yes, love us for who we are, be our friends, and we'll be your friends, but not at the price of submission or surrender of our identity. And that's the blessing, not the curse, that Bilam gives the Jewish people. He says they are a nation that will always dwell apart. They're not conformists. They will never give in on their identity. And that's a remarkable prediction because everything was tried to get the Jews to give up their Jewish identity, both God forbid, death, Haman, Hitler, and sometimes enticement, like the Hellenists during the time of Hanukkah, come convert to Hellenism, give up your Jewish identity. There's advantages, there's, you'll get ahead in life. And as a nation, sadly, many individuals have, but as a nation, we've never given up our identity. And all predicted and prophesied in the very words of Bilam. In the last five minutes, just a very practical takeaway from this week's Torah portion, because there's so much in it, we're not gonna get to all of it, obviously. A lot of blessings, uh, they're like a crouching lion. What does it mean a crouching lion? A lion is that they rise up with strength, even when they're crouching, they're not down for long. The Jews are down, but then they rise back up again. A remarkable trait. All the traits of the Jews are really predicted by Bilam. You could really learn who you are as a Jew. You want to know your spiritual DNA, what you made up. Just study in depth the prophecy of Bilam. He nails it, obviously, because he's speaking the words of God about us, which is unbelievable to hear it from a non-Jew, a non-Jewish prophet who doesn't want to say good things. He's not looking with rose colored glasses. He's looking with an intention to curse. But a very practical lesson. A rabbi say, and this is a mission and ethics of our fathers. Remember I told you, Bilaam was a very great prophet. Well, Moshe was a great prophet, but another great prophet, of course, was Abraham, was also a prophet. And there is a Mishnah in Pirkei Avot. I don't remember the exact chapter and verse, but I'm sure you can find it. It says like this. There are the disciples of Abraham, our forefather, and there are the disciples of Bilam. How do you know? Are you a follower of Abraham or a follower of Bilam? So Rabbi say, I'm pulling out the sitter to find the prick of but it says like this. It says there are three traits that the disciples of Abraham have, and then there are three traits that the disciples of Bilam have. What are the three traits of the disciples of Abraham, meaning that the three traits that Abraham had? So rabbis say the three traits is, let me see if I can remember it. Abraham has a good eye, a, a positive eye, he has a humble spirit and a good eye, a humble spirit. And the third one is he has a, you could use the word satiable appetite, which means a contentment. So humility, contentment, and positivity. That's the three traits of Abraham. What are the three traits of Bilam? a bad eye, a negative eye, an insatiable appetite, lust for money, for power, whatever it is, never content, and an arrogant spirit. And now that you learned for the past hour about who Bilam was, you understand why. He's looking for the bad in the Jews. He had all the power and wealth and importance, but he wanted more. So he was led astray by his desire for more power, more wealth, more honor to go curse the Jews, even though he knew God didn't want him to, but his appetite was insatiable. He had a very lustful appetite, never content, never satisfied. And he was arrogant. He was arrogant to think that he could go against the will of Hashem. And therefore the takeaway message of this whole Torah portion is that at the end, as I told you, in a few weeks from now, there's a war with Midian, and it says Bilam is killed by the sword. He dies in battle, because that's the end of those who are arrogant, those who are never content, those who are bad, evil eye, as opposed to the disciples of Abraham, the Jewish people who still try to follow the traits of Abraham, 
be humble, to be, have a good eye, and to be uh, content with the blessings God gives you. And so the powerful lesson of this week's Torah portion is, if you want to summarize the Torah portion in one word, you could perhaps say the word is love. Because what God's saying is, I love the Jewish people. And therefore, I will not let you, Bilaam, curse the Jewish people. And you may say, why did God care if Bilaam curses the Jews? We know that God told Abraham, those who bless you will be blessed. Those who curse you will be cursed. Let Bilaam curse. They'll just come upon him to curses. But God doesn't want us to hear anything but blessings. And therefore, God puts blessings in the mouth of Bilaam, in our mouth, enemy's mouth. And it's a way of God communicating to us his love for us. And Bilaam doesn't change his ways. He, he, he meets his end with the sword. Nothing changes his mind, even the, the angel with the sword. He still goes on his journey. So Bilaam doesn't change. And Moab doesn't change either. Even though the blessings came out of Bilaam's mouth, you would think the king of Moab would say, whoa, 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 maybe I'm starting with the wrong people. God's putting blessings in his mouth. No, he goes on his way. When Bilaam tells him, send out the Moabite women to entice the Jewish men, he, he does it. He doesn't change either. And the curses and the, don't affect the Jews either. Only blessings come out. Well, the reason we the story happens is for us to see how much God loves us and to know that, yes, there are people out there looking with a bad eye and there's anti-Semites and there's haters and there's people. Who are, and it's not only, of course, it's towards the Jewish people, but it's really towards any person who experiences someone else's hate, someone else's evil eye, someone else's negativity. But you should know God loves you. And if you know God loves you, then you don't have to be concerned with the haters. And um, it's just a remarkable story with really re incredible, powerful lessons for all of us to learn. And, you know, like I said, tomorrow, someone wished me a good trip. Oh, God willing, I'll be there for two weeks um, and, and have all of you in mind and send you only blessings and look forward to coming back and telling you about our trip and what we experienced. But, you know, when, when I go to Israel, just like when you go to Israel, wherever you look, you see blessings. You see a remarkable country with remarkable accomplishments, remarkable people doing amazing things. And you say, why doesn't the world see what, what I see? But when you're a Bilam and you're just looking to curse, then that's what you're looking to do. So you come to it with a negative mindset. And unfortunately, the haters, that's what they're looking to do. And again, the lesson is not just about Bilam and non-Jews. It's for all of us. We always have to ask ourselves, you know, are we biased? Are we looking at people honestly, objectively? Are we seeing the good in people? You know, or, 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 or God forbid, have we become cynical or negative? And the message is be positive, be a blessing uh, in your words, in your actions, be uplifting, be inspiring for people. Don't go with negativity because look what happened to Bill when he tried to curse. Uh, besides the fact that his curses were ineffective and they turned into blessings, he himself had a terrible downfall. So that gives you a good a summary or overview of this unbelievable story. And uh, wish everyone a good rest of the week. If you're coming to lunch and learn tomorrow, maybe I'll, I won't see you tomorrow actually because my flight is 12 o'clock. And uh, wish everyone a a good uh, continuation of your summers wherever you're doing it and having it and experiencing it and uh, if you would like uh, a blessing at the hotel just email me uh, your name or a note and I'll make sure to have everyone in mind so again everyone have a wonderful day and a rest of a good week